want to get you up to speed on all the developments that happened today in the Israeli Hamas conflict there. We have a live picture there. Uh, this is an Ashkelon, Israel, looking into Gaza at the moment. This comes as Secretary of State today, uh, Antony Blinken, there meeting with Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. We also uh, have this uh, pretty bombshell report in Politico today as well. Politico reporting U.S. officials have asked the Israeli military to explain its airstrike on a densely populated refugee camp in Gaza this week. Uh, and this all dovetails as well with a major speech given today there in Lebanon by the leader of Hezbollah, the terrorist group there uh, in the country to Israel's north. Let's talk about all of this right now with our friend, freelance journalist, Zach Andrews standing by for us live in Tel Aviv with the latest. Zach, good to see you. So you've really been tracking uh, all of those stories that I just mentioned today, uh, including this address given today by Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. What was his message today? Well, I can tell you how the message was received in throughout the Arab world. This was a highly anticipated speech because the the precursor to uh, this this moment today was that Hezbollah, a army of over 100,000, was on the northern border with Israel, saber rattling, potentially involving themselves in this fight. But today it was a very subdued, as if you could say so, a subdued tone from the Hezbollah leader because he indirectly uh, claims that this is a war with Israel, but did not uh, sign any sort of specific strategy forward, other than saying that Hamas must win this war and that Hamas was uh, on a, a righteous path to victory, but not saying that Hezbollah itself would involve themselves in the fight. It was also uh, curious to note that he specifically pointed out that Hamas carried this attack out without their knowledge. He, he get, went to great lengths to point this out in an hours long speech uh, that did not really signify anything in, in specific as to what would happen next for Hezbollah. He did call out the Americans and um, pointed to the U.S. Uh, carrier groups in the region and, and made it very clear that America was also to blame, that the United States was at fault for what was happening here. Uh, but again, did not specifically said Hezbollah would involve themselves in this fight. A, a very tense moment in the North. You see some of the images uh, from my friend, uh, freelancer in Beirut, uh, Hunter Williamson. He was able to attend this event. There was thousands of supporters, many watching the live stream on television throughout the area. Um, some of the folks in that area did s express their discontent, their, their frustration that uh, the Hassan Nasrallah did not take a, a bigger leap forward and declare a broader war in this region. But for now, Israeli sources are very pleased with the result of this speech. They feel like the deterrence they have laid out over the past now 29 days of this war was effective and that they were able to, for the most part, deter Hezbollah's involvement. Yeah, I mean, Zach, it's so interesting. Um, so Nasrallah's speech, uh, he said this, quote, some say I'm going to announce that we have entered the battle. He went on to say, we've already entered the battle on October 8th. He argued that Hezbollah's yeah. cross-border strikes uh, have pulled away Israeli forces that would otherwise be focused on Hamas in Gaza. But it seems like Hamas doesn't feel that way. I mean, Nasrallah stopped short of going, like you said, full scale into the war effort being led by Hamas. And that led to, to your point, a lot of disappointment there. And Nasrallah doing this by video conference, he's notoriously a recluse. Mm -hmm. Is that because he fears for his safety when he goes out in public? It's a great question. In this particular space, there's any leader that is involved in any of these organizations, they are reclusive, right? Because they are hiding from uh, the potential uh, Israeli forces that obviously are, have, have 
pointed as these leaders as being leaders of terrorist organizations and that should they make appearances in public, that would be something that would catch the Israelis' eye, obviously. Uh, this speech taking place uh, uh, remotely with the thousands of viewers, um, it, it's hard to say exactly what the, the uh, strategy or the, the path forward for Hezbollah is when they know they have a massive target on their back. And to your earlier point, the, the skirmishes in, in any other situation, uh, if this was happening a month, two months ago before the Hamas attack, uh, the amount of uh, fighting that is taking place on the northern border with Lebanon would would capture the world's attention as a major conflict but because of what's happening in the gaza strip with limited casualties ranging in the dozens in the north this has not been considered a full-blown escalation now hezbollah again has upwards of a hundred thousand fighters so a full escalation of a conflict in the north would look at a much greater scale than what we have seen so for a some sort of formal declaration of war to not be followed by large engagements in the north is something that's uh, obviously uh, being used or, or being pointed yeah. as a, a major precursor for something larger. But right now it, it has been focused on Gaza, that the amount of fighting in the Gaza Strip has been intense and, and to the north it has been very limited. Yeah, no, oh, that's such a great point, Zach, as well. Um, and I, I was kind of curious, and we're going to ask some of our experts who are going to come on right after we're done speaking with you, you know, why this speech and why now? I'm kind of curious there. But to your point, let's uh, get into what's happening on the ground there in Gaza. Um, there's been a lot of reports today, uh, and we're going to talk about them with you, that Israel struck an ambulance in Gaza City today that it said was carrying militants, but which health authorities there in the Hamas-controlled enclave said was evacuating wounded people from the besieged north to the south of the territory. I want to put up this tweet here. Uh, this is from Jonathan Conricus, a spokesman with the IDF. We spoke to him live yesterday. He tweeted this, Zach. He said Hamas has a long record of abusing ambulances in Gaza to move combatants, commanders, and weapons. By doing so, they're violating international law. When we perceive an immediate threat, we're well within our rights to strike as they have relinquished special protection. Uh, so this is getting a lot of attention today. What more do we know about this particular strike on this ambulance there in Gaza? Well, if you start with this, it's again the Al-Shifa hospital, which encountered that blast uh, about a week, week and a half ago that captured the world's attention, the explosion in the parking lot and the the rapid controversy surrounding who fired which missile and where it came from. This ambulance was, uh, according to the Red Crescent Society, which operates some of these ambulances that were transporting vehicles to the south, they initially came out and said that uh, none of their uh, staff with the ambulance was injured. About an hour ago, they have now said that there actually were injuries, but that did correlate with what the IDF was telling uh, all of us, which was that there were militants inside the ambulances and that was what they struck. The Red Crescent said that they were traveling southbound. Now, uh, I should back up for a moment and say that Gaza City now, as of yesterday, has been fully encircled. The IEF has told us that they have forces all along the south and they have encircled from the north as well. So this is a isolated city. They have cut it off from both points and then the coastal road that runs down the Mediterranean was uh, basically blocked. The Red Crescent saying that the, the facilities or the ambulances that they were trying to take south were blocked by rubble and debris in the road. So they decided to turn around. They were trying to take wounded to the Rafa crossing, they said. They were about a mile, uh, sorry, a kilometer away from the hospital when they say they encountered a missile strike that damaged the vehicles and they were able to continue and then a second strike taking place meters away from the gate to the hospital okay. they say now independent reports are confirming that there are at least a dozen over a dozen fatalities in this strike on the ambulances 
We have not been able to independently confirm the occupants of the ambulances if they okay. were in fact militants. But gotcha. it does signal to the rest of the world that the Israelis are willing to strike what would normally be, I'm, in fact, it would in all scenarios, are civ that civilian infrastructure and the rules of engagement in conflicts all across the world do require extreme diligence and care when involving civilian infrastructure and when civilians are in the line of fire. The IDF will tell you, well, they have told the people of Gaza City to evacuate to the right. south, that there would be strikes regardless in the north and that they were going to consider targets that are hiding behind civilian infrastructure. They keep reminding us that the tunnels and the infrastructure for Hamas are located under hospitals, under schools, under civilian buildings, that those targets are what they're considering fair game. Okay. Now, that does not change the reality for the people that were involved in this strike that were nearby. The hospitals are the only point of refuge for civilians if you live in Gaza City. It's one of the only places that you can get reliable power. It's where a lot of the journalists go to charge their cameras so they can show the world what is happening to Gaza City and the Gaza Strip currently. That ambulance, again, we have confirmed of over a dozen fatalities but no confirmation as to the identity of who those people were if they were, in fact, uh, uh, Hamas militants. All right. Uh, you know, and Zach, we'll be talking about this a little bit later on this hour. But lastly, though, I know you're in Tel Aviv. Uh, that's, you know, further north than you have been. You've been down there uh, in Ashkelon, in Starot, near the Gaza border. And so from a personal standpoint, you have been there now almost a full month since this all began. What's going on there in Tel Aviv? Uh, are there still rocket attacks that far north into central Israel? And what will you be looking for going into the weekend, just from a personal standpoint as a journalist there on the ground, now almost a month into this war? Well, there were rocket attacks again today on central Israel. A remarkable fact when you're considering that the number of strikes and uh, the amount of force targeting these locations that do fire rockets from the Gaza Strip. The IDF says that they are taking these locations out, but still they have the capacity. Hamas has the capacity to strike deep into central Israel. The Iron Dome intercepts them. It's a consistent uh, dance between these uh, two very close regional uh, launches of the Hamas rockets from the Strip into central Israel. They're intercepted overhead. That was happening again today. As for what we're looking for going into the weekend and the next week ahead, Secretary Blinken arrived today and had several high-level meetings. It was uh, quite curious to see him also meet with the opposition party member here in Israel. And, and that is something that is signaling to a lot of spaces that the United States is trying to push this, uh, in the last few days at least, this attempt at a pause, yeah. at a ceasefire. Now, the current Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying that is not going to happen unless right. there are any, there's any movement on releasing hostages and that there will be no ceasefire until the hostages are released. The Biden administration calling for a pause instead, a humanitarian pause. The Netanyahu administration saying, well, that will only give time to our enemy to re-equip, to refuel, right. and to prepare for the continued battle that will certainly last for uh, many more weeks inside Gaza. Now, Blinken, Secretary Blinken leaving today, uh, and one of that la his last meetings was with the opposition party member, um, the former prime minister before Netanyahu was reelected last year. I think that a lot of people forget the intensity of what's happened in Israel's democracy in the last year. Netanyahu has been indicted for bribery and corruption, and then he won re-election. And for the past year, there have been massive protests, massive demonstrations right. in the streets of Tel Aviv, of Jerusalem, for his proposed changes to Israel's judicial system. Right. So it's very remarkable to see a U.S. Biden administration official meeting with the former prime minister and the opposition party 
during a time like this, some see it as potentially undermining the current administration and the ability to wage war going forward. Others see it as the U.S. hedging their bets and participating again in this political dance where we don't know what happens next and neither does the administration. Right, and uh, that's another question we have. Will the Netanyahu government, will his coalition survive this war when all is said and done? To your point, Blinken meeting with Benny Gantz today as well as Netanyahu. Yes, they have entered into this emergency unity government, you know, to better tackle the war at hand. So that's something we'll have to look out for as well amid all the internal domestic politics there in Israel. Um, Zach Anders, we really appreciate your reporting, uh, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andrew. And to Zach's point, uh, we're going to be bringing on some experts at the bottom of the hour to kind of dive in a little deeper uh, to some of Zach's reporting. Uh, but remember, all week I've been asking uh, some of our national security experts to help me uh, split the hairs here between these two words, uh, pause, and ceasefire. Uh, are they just a distinction without a difference? Well, this is Blinken's line today uh, from Lucas Tomlinson saying Blinken in Tel Aviv that a humanitarian pause could help get hostages back. So it seems somewhat like Blinken is on board with what President Biden and National Security Council spokesman John Kirby uh, has been saying throughout the course of the last four, five days, if you will. But to that, we also heard from Bibi Netanyahu today, and he was quite vehement, uh, saying that there is not going to be any type of ceasefire soon. Lucas Tomlinson tweeting this out, saying, following the meeting with the U.S. Secretary of State, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu rejects calls for ceasefire, saying his forces will continue attacking Hamas in Gaza with full force until hostages released warns if Hezbollah enters the war, it will pay dearly.